just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channel's television Lagos. So a reminder of our top stories. Again, INEC describes performance by police and other security agencies in the conduct of the 2019 general elections, as well as the polls in Kogi and Bayelsa State, as poor. President Buhari says Nigeria cannot afford another civil war as he challenges the youth to brace for leadership and ignore people with narrow ethnic or regional interest. Former President Dr. Goodluck Jonathan breaks silence on the attack on his residence in Bayelsa State, ascribes action to youth rascality. And Iran denies that it shot down a Ukrainian jetliner that crashed near Tehran on Tuesday, killing 176 people. Plus, business, sports, news from Abuja, the FCT, and later from our studios in London. Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via our smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, and Rocco TV. Efforts to reposition the Nigerian broadcasting industry seem to have taken a leap towards actualization with the recent directive from the Minister of Information and Culture, Mr. Lai Mohammed, to the National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, which is a regulatory agency for radio and television stations in the country. Last year, the federal government announced its intention to carry out a major transformation of the broadcast industry, after which it inaugurated a seven-man committee to carry out the reforms. The minister's directive to the NBC, which he says is based on the recommendations of the committee, covers a wide range of issues, including the need for the NBC to implement a measure that will reposition the broadcast industry, create jobs, promote local content, and formulate regulations for the online media. The NBC is also expected to come up with a regulation for international broadcasters beaming signals into Nigeria and hate speech. Other directives include the regulation of human resources and staff welfare, funding for the implementation of the reforms, monitoring, independence of the regulator, and ease of issuing licenses as well as competition and monopoly issues. The NBC has also been directed to ensure that broadcasters utilize the content and services of the Nigerian independent producers in line with the regulatory requirement for 70% local content. To discuss this issue further, we're now being joined by a veteran in the industry and professor of broadcast management, as well as the former director general of the Nigerian Television Authority, Professor Tony Iradia. A pleasure having you with us on the News at 10. Thank you very much. Now, the minister listed a number of benefits from the reforms in the industry. What impact do you think the implementation of these recommendations will make in the industry? Well, I think, to be fair, um, it's too early to begin to think of what benefits will come. But if we prefix it by saying, if what the minister is saying will be done, then certainly there will be a number of benefits. Uh, all the issues that have been raised are quite good. I mean, uh, the idea of sports rights and all of that, the local content, providing jobs and all of that, they are all good. The problem I have with the broadcast regulatory framework in Nigeria is the main issue of the autonomy of the broadcast regulator. For as long as the broadcast regulator takes directives from the minister, for that long would there be a problem? Because the minister is a politician and the tendency for him to issue directives that will favor his partisan interests cannot be ruled out. But more importantly, the broadcast regulator cannot be managed on a day-by-day -day basis by a politician. The chief executive of the NBC, the CEO or director general, cannot be a politician because broadcasting is a political issue. Political broadcast is the main issue in broadcasting. And if the regulator is not an impartial personality, the tendency will be for him to engage in political vendetta, be engaged in pursuit of uh, opponents of government of the day. So the issue of autonomy is the main one. All these other issues that have been narrated in the last couple of hours will fall in place 
if the MBC is an autonomous, independent regulatory authority that is premised on professionalism and excellence. Well, Professor Aridia, what do you foresee in the implementation of the recommendations? Let's look at it from the issue on the regulation of the web, online television and radio, as, and also international broadcasters beaming signals into Nigeria. Those issues are integral to regulation. If you have a competent body doing regulation, you don't need to go and tell them. It's like telling somebody, oh, you need to drink water. I mean, you don't, of course you need to drink water. <laughs> so there are things that stand on their own. The things the minister has listed are things that a proper regulator who is a professional, who understands the meaning of broadcast, will be able to do without anybody directing him. Right? But the problem is when, by the time you begin to do directives, look, for example, the minister, as of today, is supposed to give directives to the NBC. But this directive was beamed to the rest of the world. He should have just sent a directive to the NBC. The fact that he's beaming it to the rest of the world already indicates to me, who has been in this industry for a long time, that perhaps the NBC is not even listening to the minister. So he wants to tell the rest of us, look, I've told them that this is what they should do, so they have to do it. You know, he didn't need to tell the rest of us. He should have just sent. But even then, we cannot... Uh, contradict ourselves. If we say NBC should be independent, it should not get directives from anybody. Finally now, Prof, how easy would it be to implement the provision regarding competition and monopoly issues, especially the one that has to do with exclusivity rights in sports broadcasting? I'm not quite sure government itself understood the intricacies of sports rights. If somebody has a right, it's slightly difficult for you to begin to direct him on how he's going to handle that right because it's something you bid for and you get it. I mean, to come and issue directives on how the right can be distributed to avoid monopoly is to, is to be belaboring the question. The truth is that those are the things that things like the uh, Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria, uh, an association of professionals who will work together in partnership to ensure that when there is sports right, it is for the benefit of everybody in the jurisdiction so that a large number of Nigerians, for example, can watch matches. If you watch matches in this, in, that we watch in this country are not popular because the television stations don't show them to us. Even when it involves Nigeria, we don't watch them. So stopping a monopoly is not by issuing directives. It's by ensuring that there's collaboration and uh, cooperation among the practitioners, which can come from professional uh, associations not from directives. Professor Tony Iredia, a pleasure sharing your thoughts with us on the news. Thank there. you very much. Now let's cross over to Abuja Studios where Linda is standing by with more stories. Hello, Linda. Hello, Melinda. Now moving on from the conversation on broadcast media reforms. In what appears to be a clarification on the developing issues in the National Council for Arts and Culture, the Director General of the Council, Mr. Lucia Gunrushewe, is insisting that his current travails are linked to his refusal to relinquish the arts and crafts village in Abuja to interested persons. He says the property, which is valued at 9 billion naira, was shot down because it was being used as a drug den and hideout for criminals. Mr. Rushewe, who is speaking during an interaction with journalists in Abuja, however, refused to entertain further questions on the court order committing him to prison for contempt. Justice Judo KK of the Federal High Court had ordered the remand of Mr. Rushewe in prison for alleged contempt of the order of court made on December the 16th, 2017. When I became TG, like some of you knew, they offered me money. You can quote me to put my eyes on the other side for them to continue. The head of drug selling was in that place. The headquarters of drug in Abuja was in that building. When we took over, we met over 26 stolen cars inside that place. The journalists that went there saw it, not that I'm telling stories. Police met AK-47 guns in that place. I will show you the ammunitions police got, not us. I will show you. Some of you are aware. All these are stolen cars that was parked here. Stolen cars. This is the ammunition. This police picture is not ours. 
that place has been on for over 22 years. Those people are using the place illegally. Nobody has been able to talk. And Otu Barushiwe has come out to say, no, it must stop. So what is the crime? We just got a letter from the police that opened the place now. Are you a security agent? Am I a security agent? No. It's police that everything has been done legally. Eh? This Nigerian police giving us go ahead to, to, to open the place now. So we follow, we follow process. To legal matters, the magistrate's court sitting in Akbomu, Oshun State, has ordered the remand of self-acclaimed prophet Shegun Philip Owolabi Ad Adeko and his mother Biola Adeko for allegedly killing favor Dali Oladele and using vital parts of her organs for money ritual. Their plea to the charges could not be taken before the magistrate owing to the nature of the case. Magistrate Idowu Faith subsequently adjourned the matter to Wednesday, March the 25th for mention and ordered the remand of the defendants at the Elisha Correctional Center. And staying in Oshun State, the 25 members of a non-academic staff union of Yoshun State University who were charged to court for disruption of school activities as a result of a protest held on November 22, 2018, have called on the state governor, Boyega Uyetola, to intervene in the matter. The union members were charged to court for disrupting the school's convocation ceremony, which was to be attended by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo. In the cross-examination by the prosecuting counsel, Moses Faremi, the vice-chancellor of the university, Professor Labu Popola, stated that the union members blocked the entrance of the university and assaulted some members of management. But the counsel to the defendants, Oludele Amole, says the union members just had a peaceful protest, which falls within their rights as employees of institution. The magistrate adjourned the matter to January the 31st, 2020. Outside Nigeria, an uneasy calm is in place in South Africa's Rosedale and Kemo's communities following protests over the killing of a policeman on Tuesday. 28-year-old Constable Stefano Vesa Vesahi was found dead on Wednesday morning with a single stab wound to the chest in a friend's home. Community members, on hearing the development, took to the streets in two separate communities, demanding justice and that foreign nationals who deal in drugs in their communities must leave. As South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Dibia reports. Two communities around Kimos near Uppington in the northern Cape province, where the stabbing incident occurred, have been up in arms over alleged drug dealers in their midst. And this week's killing of a 28-year-old police constable seem to be the last straw. They are demanding that foreign nationals who are up to no good should leave their communities. Police are on high alert and were seen guiding some foreign nationals to safety. An initial report stated that the person who stabbed the deceased to death was a Nigerian citizen, but an official police statement did not state the nationality. We actually condemn in strong terms uh, the the alleged killing of the police officer by whoever, by whatever national, the person may be for whatever reason, is condemnable. And I don't think this case is related to xenophobia at all. This mission sees it as a case of criminality. And so that is why we continue to monitor development. At this point, the police is calling for calm to be maintained. Following this uh, incident of the murder of the police officer, the communities of uh, Camus and Uppington, they mobilized and started a protest action demanding the arrest of the suspect. And immediately after the suspect was arrested, we called for the community to be more tolerant and to allow for the investigation to take its course. So far, both those areas um, appear to be stable, but police are monitoring those areas very closely. And we are constantly in talks with leadership of those areas to ensure that uh, peace and tranquility is maintained in those areas. Brigadier Vishnu Naidu insisted that the nationality of the 35-year-old suspect cannot be disclosed for now until his first appearance at the Kemos Magistrates Court on Monday, the 13th of January, 2020. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. When the news at 10 returns, 
Office of Attorney General of the Federation drops multi-billion dollar tax payment dispute against telecoms giant MTN Nigeria. That's in business news. Plus, Iran denies that it shot down a Ukrainian jetliner that crashed near Tehran on Tuesday. And more from our London bureau in Around the World in Five. Join us again.